This lecture addresses the structure of cells in study question number 13. Further information um, can be found in chapter 3. Cells have an intricate internal structure that enables them to perform various functions in the body. The figure on this slide shows some of these internal structures in a cell that lines the pulmonary artery. The green fluorescence labels actin filaments. These are proteins that are part of the internal skeleton of a cell called the cytoskeleton. The blue fluorescence labels the nucleus. The red fluorescence labels multiple mitochondria where, cell where cellular energy is produced. Cells vary in shape and size. And some internal structure, depending on the specific function the cell performs. On this slide are some diagrams of different cell types and their structures reflect their different functions. The upper left picture shows neurons with extensions that perform electrical communication. The upper middle picture shows epithelial cells that line the trachea. The upper right are red blood cells that carry oxygen. The lower left cell is a muscle cell that's elongated now, but it can shorten during contraction. The lower middle diagram is a row of epithelial cells that provide a thin membrane in the lungs across which gases can flow. The lower right diagram shows some white blood cells that secrete substances to provide us with immune protection. Regardless of cell type, most cells have the same basic structure. That includes a nucleus that houses DNA, cytoplasm consisting of the fluid cytosol, which is viscous, and internal structures called organelles, as well as cytoskeletal proteins that give the, the cell some shape. The third component of a cell is a cell membrane, which of course forms the boundary of a cell, and most importantly, it can interact with the environment in which it exists. Now this basic structure is altered somewhat in a few cell types. For example, mature red blood cells do not contain a nucleus or any DNA because the nucleus is lost when the cell matures. In our previous slide, we saw a picture of a skeletal muscle cell here. Notice this cell has many nuclei. That's because multiple cells form, uh, fuse during development and the nuclei are retained. Let's look in more detail at cells and their structure by starting with the nucleus. As I mentioned, most cells have one nucleus, other cells multinucleated or anucleate. The structure of a nucleus includes a nuclear membrane, also called the nuclear envelope, which controls what can get in or out of the nucleus. This helps to protect the DNA. The nuclear membrane is made up of two phospholipid bilayers. Within the nucleus is a dark staining region, shown blue on this slide, and it stains darkly because there's RNA and protein. This is where the ribosomal RNA is made that will become part of ribosomes. Surrounding the nucleolus is thin thread-like material shown with strands of purple called chromatin. Chromatin is a loosely coiled form of DNA. 
This slide shows a more detailed structure of the nuclear membrane. Notice that it consists of two phospholipid bilayers, giving added protection. In addition, the nuclear pores that allow materials to pass in and out of the nucleus are really quite complex in structure. The chromatin of human cells consists of DNA wound around histone proteins. In a non-dividing cell, all 46 chromosomes of the human genome are in this loosely coiled chromatin form. But right before a cell divides, the DNA will supercoil as shown on the right. When the DNA supercoils, it forms what we know of as dense chromosomes. These chromosomes prevent fragmentation when a cell is dividing and the cell has to move the chromosomes into an um, appropriate location. The 46 chromosomes of the human genome have been extracted from a dividing cell The 46 chromosomes in the human genome have been extracted from a dividing cell and lined up into 23 pairs in this diagram. One pair of chromosomes codes for the same kind of information. When chromosomes are displayed in this linear format, it's known as a karyotype. It enables geneticists to look for damage and any abnormalities. Beyond the nucleus, we'll start looking now at the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the area between the nucleus and the cell's membrane. It contains a viscous fluid called cytosol, made up largely of water, 70 to 80 percent, salts, and organic compounds like enzymes, glucose, lipid droplets, and individual monomers like amino acids, monosaccharides, ATP, nucleotides, and of course, organelles are suspended in the cytosol to form the cytoplasm. In addition to being the fluid in which organelles are suspended, the cytosol has several functions related to the presence of enzymes and cytoskeletal proteins. The functions provided by these enzymes and proteins include breaking down compounds, removing wastes from the cell, and producing ATP, the cell's main form of energy. So the next section of this lecture will cover the function and structure of various organelles. Most of this information will be familiar to you from your reading. Cellular organelles located in the cytoplasm belong to one of two types. One type includes organelles that have a membrane surrounding them. The other type are organelles with no membrane that are really aggregates of molecules. Those that do have a membrane the membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, and they include the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, also known as the Golgi body or Golgi complex, the mitochondria, lysosomes, and peroxisomes. The molecular aggregate compounds that don't have a membrane are the ribosomes, centrioles, and then cytoskeleton. 
I will begin discussing the function of the different membrane-bound organelles closest to the nucleus. The endoplasmic reticulum is a membranous system of sacs and tubules. Its cavities, shown here, are called cisterna or cisterns. It has two distinct divisions, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is noticeable by the presence of ribosomes, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that doesn't have ribosomes on its surface. The structure of the rough and the smooth really reflects their independent functions. So the rough ER is where proteins made by the ribosomes attached to it are synthesized and inserted. When, when the proteins enter the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the rough ER can add carbohydrates to the proteins. This process is called glycosylation. Ultimately, the function of the rough ER is to package proteins into transport vesicles to be sent to the cytoplasm. Ultimately, any protein that has entered the rough ER and then left in transport vesicles is destined to go to the cell membrane and not stay within the cytoplasm. The functions of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, in contrast, is to synthesize lipids, particularly steroids, and store calcium. To review the function of both the rough and the smooth ER, I'd like to show you how these proteins and lipids leave the ER within transport vesicles. First, the ER membrane invaginates, constricts, and then a vesicle buds off of the endoplasmic reticulum. Any proteins, or maybe lipids in the case of the smoothie ER, that are inside this vesicle will remain so when it pinches completely to form this transport vesicle. Now this process can be reversed if a vesicle wish, wishes or does fuse with another organelle, because phospholipid membranes can fuse together quite easily. I'm really sorry I keep flipping between slides. It's not me, it's the mouse. I, I don't know what's wrong with the mouse. I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay, next we're gonna look at the Golgi body. The Golgi body is also called the Golgi apparatus and the Golgi complex. You can use any term you want. It is made up of a, a series of hollow flattened sacs. They're shown in green on this diagram within the red square. The cis face of the Golgi is closest to the endoplasmic reticulum. The trans face is furthest away from the endoplasmic reticulum. It's the cis face where the transport vesicles merge with the Golgi, and it's the trans face from which transport vesicles leave the Golgi. Okay, so the Golgi complex has a very specific function in transporting or trafficking lipids and proteins. As the cis face receives a transport vesicle, the phospholipid membranes fuse 
and the contents are dumped into the Golgi first sac. Within the Golgi are enzymes that can modify these lipids and proteins. Usually they do so through glycosylation. These lipids and proteins will eventually enter the next sac and the next sac because vesicles will bud off of, of each flattened sac. In some cases, there's an actual merging where they just flow right through. Ultimately, what happens is that the different types of lipids and proteins found within the Golgi get sorted into different regions within the transphase. Notice that in this region of the trans Golgi, there are very dark staining molecules. Over here on this side, there are very light staining molecules. That's because what happens is the Golgi sorts and organizes or moves the proteins into certain regions of the Golgi apparatus as it moves them. <coughs> Sometimes the Golgi complex is called the post office of the cell for this reason. Finally, once the modified lipids and proteins reach the most trans face stack of the Golgi, secretory vesicle forms and buds off of the trans face. We will review this process again after we um, look at ribosomes a little bit. So here's a ribosome consisting of two subunits. All ribosomes have these two subunits, but there are two types, mainly named by where they're located. A free ribosome is suspended within the cytoplasm, shown here. A bound ribosome is attached to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Both subunits of the ribosome have RNA molecules and protein. The function of ribosomes, all ribosomes, no matter if they're free or bound, is protein synthesis. So ribosomes make polypeptides. They make the polypeptide with a sequence of amino acids linked together. These amino acids are assembled depending on the information encoded within nuclear DNA. So in this picture, we have a copy of a gene that has been sent out to a ribosome from the nucleus. This purple ribosome is reading the information in this gene. And while reading it, it puts together a sequence of amino acids. It actually started down here. Sorry. It made it. It's making it this way. The polypeptide will eventually be released from the ribosome. Free ribosomes make proteins that are going to stay in the cytoplasm. Bound ribosomes make proteins that will be transported from the rough ER to the Golgi and then ultimately to the cell membrane. So this slide shows a little bit about how bound ribosomes make proteins and how they know, how do ribosomes know that that protein's got to be inserted into endoplasmic reticulum. So first you should know that protein synthesis always begins with a free ribosome, always, and here it is, okay? That free ribosome is reading a copy, it's green in this case, of the DNA. And it's making a protein by leaving up, in this case we've got four, different amino acids. It's going to link up amino acids to make a polypeptide. If it detects a, per a certain sequence 
of amino acids called the signal sequence. This ribosome knows it needs to dock on the endoplasmic reticulum and continue making the polypeptide and inserting it and inserting it into the endoplasmic reticulum. So that polypeptide is inserted into the ER lumen. So in summary, the endoplasmic reticulum, the ribosomes, and the Golgi body are all involved with protein transport. The smooth ER and the Golgi are involved with lipid transport. What happens in terms of transport processes is that from the trans space of the ER, a protein buds off within a transport vesicle, which fuses to the cis space of the Golgi. The protein makes its way through the Golgi and ultimately buds off of the trans space within a secretory vesicle. So the key words here are transport vesicle versus secretory vesicle. A transport vesicle goes from the ER to the Golgi. A secretory vesicle goes from the Golgi to the cell membrane. Now the secretory vesicle will fuse with the cell membrane. Sometimes the protein stays attached to the cell membrane. Other times it will release, be released into the extracellular fluid. We've covered a lot of cellular structures and functions, including the ER, both rough and smooth, the Golgi apparatus, ribosomes. This might be a good opportunity for you to look at your assignment or worksheet and answer some questions pertaining to those organelles. But when you're ready, you can proceed and I'll continue to discuss the other organelles, mitochondria, lysosomes, peroxisomes, centrioles, the cytoskeleton, and I will talk about the cell membrane. Okay, continuing with our cellular structures, let's look at mitochondria, another membrane-bound organelle. Actually, mitochondria is plural. A one mitochondrion, that's singular, O-N, doesn't matter. The function of a mitochondrion is ATP synthesis, and there are many mitochondria found within the cytoplasm of cells. So ATP synthesis occurs, and this is um, a process that's going to require enzymes, which are proteins. These proteins are coded for by DNA. Some of the genes required are in nuclear DNA, but the mitochondria also has DNA. And so there are mitochondrial genes that also code for these enzymes. The structure of a mitochondria consists of two phospholipid bilayer membranes. So there's an outer membrane, shown here as orange. There's an inner membrane that's green. And the space in between the two, kind of like cytosol, is called the intermembrane space. There are ribosomes located here that can make protein or enzymes that the mitochondria needs. Inside or deep to the inner membrane is the matrix. And this contains um, many compounds, but most importantly, the location of mitochondrial DNA. Notice that the inner membrane has points of invagination, right, like this. Those are called cristae, and these invaginations, or cristae, are very important for um, ATP synthesis because an enzyme called ATP synthase is located there. Our next membrane-bound organelle, um, I'm going to group two together, 
are lysosomes and peroxisomes. On a diagram or within a cell under the microscope, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish one from the other. So I'm kind of treating them together. They do have different functions, though. <clears throat> They're small vesicles, membrane-bound vesicles, that contain enzymes that break down carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. They do differ slightly in function and where they originate from. Lysosomes bud off of the Golgi body and contain enzymes that can break down old organelles or ingested material that the cell has ingested in vesicles. They also contain enzymes that perform what's known as programmed cell death or apoptosis. So lysosomes are important for normal functioning as well as the end of the cell's life. Peroxisomes, in contrast, arise from the ER, and they contain enzymes that just mainly break down fatty acids. They're very important in beta oxidation. Okay, we're done with membrane-bound organelles, and now we're going to look at organelles that are just aggregates of molecules. They have structure, but uh, not a phospholipid bilayer. The first will be centrioles. Centrioles are paired. There's two of them in animal cells. Plant cells don't have them. These are protein-based structures made up of microtubules. These microtubules are arranged in triplets. So each centriole has nine triplets. The function of centrioles is to make more microtubules. So it's called the microtubule synthesizing and organizing center. Now, what are these microtubules used for? Some are used just for structure. We call that part of the cytoskeleton. Other microtubules become part of the spindle apparatus that only forms when a cell is going to divide. That's what this picture shows here. This is a spindle apparatus in red made up of microtubules. It's important to move these chromosomes to ends of the cell when a cell is going to divide. Microtubules also make up cell structures called flagella and cilia, which aren't really internal structures. They're more external, as shown in this picture. So both cilia and flagella are usually attached to the surface of a cell and extend out of it. Um, and they're made up of microtubules arranged with nine outer pairs and one central pair. What happens is, they're shown in green on this diagram on the left, these filaments or tubes, microtubules, slide past one another, and that makes kind of a bending or, um, yeah, a bending movement and helps the cell propel or maybe move substances across the cell surface. So the way a flagellum works in the middle picture is that it can propel an entire cell because those microtubules produce a rotational movement. The only example of a flagellum in the human body is on a male sperm cell. The picture on the right, like in contrast, shows cilia present um, on cells that line our trachea. And these cilia, cilia don't move so much in a rotational form, but in a wave-like um, movement. And that propels substances across the surface. Okay, now we'll look at the cytoskeleton a little bit because we just looked at microtubules. The cytoskeleton 
is made up of, yes, microtubules, but also two other kinds of proteins, intermediate filaments and actin filaments. Actin filaments are sometimes called microfilaments because they're the smallest in diameter. Microtubules are the largest in diameter, and therefore intermediate filaments are named as such because they're intermediate in size. Notice that intermediate filaments form a scaffolding within the cell to give it support and structure. Also notice that actin filaments are located just interior and adjacent to the cell membrane. These different positions reflect purpose for these different proteins or cytoskeletal structures. Microtubules provide a structure along which organelles like transport vesicles can move. So substances within a cell will move. Intermediate filaments are important for the cell's strength and structural integrity, whereas actin filaments can shorten and lengthen, drawing the cell membrane with them, and allows the cell to kind of pinch up and, and extend. So it provides a crawling mechanism for a cell, like amoeboid movement. Notice that if you look in more detail at the structure of these cytoskeletal proteins, each one is made up of individual subunit, subunits. And each subunit, of course, has a name, which we're not going to worry about. Microtubules, again, help with the movement of materials like organelles within a cell, whereas actin filaments help an entire cell or a whole cell to move by a pinching or crawling mechanism. And intermediate filaments, again, provide strength. Okay, the last topic that we're going to examine, or last cellular structure that we're going to examine, is the cell's membrane. Remember, it's made up of a phospholipid bilayer, mainly, and it has very important functions, which is why we spend so much time talking about the cell membrane. It not only defines the boundary of the cell, which is important, but it interacts with other cells and the, ex and the extracellular matrix. It controls passage of materials in and out of the cell as well. A cell's membrane is largely made up of phospholipids. 98% of a membrane is lipid. There's some cholesterol there. And some of the lipids have uh, carbohydrates attached, so we call those glycolipids. What's the most important for you is that the membrane is 98% lipid. Suspended within the lipid is protein. So the cell membrane is 2% protein. We call most of these proteins transmembrane proteins. Transmembrane proteins have lots of different functions. We're going to talk about the, a little bit about the roles of those proteins later. A cell membrane is sometimes described as a fluid mosaic. A mosaic is anything that's composed of different parts. So we see that we have different types of molecules in a membrane, both protein and lipid. And fluid refers to the fact that these molecules move. The lipids and the proteins are fluidly moving or exchanging locations as the cell lives. This was discovered by an experiment that involved the fusion of two different Sorry about that. The fluidity of a cell membrane 
was discovered by an experiment in which a mouse cell's membrane proteins were labeled with blue and the human cell membrane proteins were labeled with red. And then with just a spark of electricity, these two cells were fused together, making one larger cell. Now, if the proteins can, could not move, you would expect all the red proteins to stay on one side and all the blue proteins to stay on the other. But instead, what scientists discovered after the cell was incubated over time is that the blue and red proteins which they could see with a fluorescent microscopy, um, the red and blue proteins were dispersed evenly all around the cell's membrane. Yes, this computer has a life of its own. It's just going to keep moving the slides. I'll go back. Sorry. Okay, let's talk about why membrane proteins are so important. They have four specific functions that I'll discuss. One is that they can interact with the extracellular matrix and other cells to form tissues. So these proteins can adhere to the matrix to keep the position of the cell. That'll form a tissue. And a protein can also communicate with another cell, either by adhering to it or chemically communicating with it. Another function is that these membrane proteins might actually be enzymes that catalyze a chemical reaction. Thirdly, these membrane proteins may act as channels that allow the transport of materials into or out of the cell. And lastly, there are very specific proteins that give a cell type its identity. Okay, let's look at the first function. Function of cell membrane proteins interacting with other cells and that extracellular matrix. I'll start with the extracellular matrix diagram on the right. This is the cell cytoplasm down here with two transmembrane proteins that are attached to a network of fibers called the extracellular matrix. This is suspended within fluid so there's water out here and salts and lots of things but this cell maintains its position within the larger tissue by adhering to this extracellular matrix here's another example of a membrane protein attaching to another protein but in this example the membrane protein belonging to this cell attaches to the protein of another cell. So it forms a junction. <clears throat> another way of interacting with the cell besides direct contact is to receive chemical signals. So cells communicate with one another with chemicals. This is a cell transmembrane protein that has received a chemical signal and bound to it. There will be a response inside the cell. Because I just got done talking about how cells attach to one another, I'd like to introduce you to different forms of cell-cell junctions. <clears throat> one uh, way that cells with proteins adhere to one another is through tight junctions. So tight junctions are connections between the phospholipid membranes of two different cells and transmembrane proteins reinforce that connection. They're called tight junctions because the phospholipid bilayers are so close to one another that it is that it's very difficult for substances to pass between two cells. That's why they call it tight junction. Materials won't get through here. That's particularly important in places like your stomach 
where acid is made. You don't want the acid to leak between cells. Then there are structures, adhesion structures or junctions called desmosomes. Now, you might think that they're not as strong as tight junctions, but they're actually stronger meaning these two cells will not be ripped from one another because there are so many proteins involved. There's red ones and straight purple ones and yellow ones and these long plate-like thing, plate things. They are very strong points of contact, but there's gaps between cells, so substances can actually move through. Some membrane proteins can also act as enzymes. These enzymes might function and in the sense that outside of the cell, a chemical reaction is catalyzed on the outside surface of a cell or maybe the inside surface of the cell. It doesn't really matter. The point is a membrane protein is an enzyme, can be an enzyme. Another very important function of membrane proteins is to control the passage of materials into or out of the cell. It's important to remember that the phospholipid bilayer only allows hydrophobic substances to cross, so only lipids can cross. But these proteins allow hydrophilic substances to pass. And there's two examples of these types of transport proteins. One type of transport protein forms a gap junction, which is a pore that exists between two cells. In this case, multiple transmembrane proteins in one cell lines up with multiple transport proteins on the other cell, and they form I don't know if they're transport proteins per se, but they form a pore through which substances can pass from one cell to the other. One place where this occurs in your body is in heart muscle. It's important that multiple cells contract at the same time or really close to the same time. And that means that ions need to get from one cell to the other very quickly in order for contraction to happen. When we discuss the heart, we'll talk about gap junctions. Another type of membrane protein that allows the transport of materials is called a membrane channel or a channel protein. It forms a pore, but it's just one protein. Lastly, uh, some proteins, particularly glycoproteins, are very specific for different cell types. So you'll have different proteins with different carbohydrates attached to them in a liver cell versus a muscle cell versus a skin cell. So it gives the cell identity. Another way that cell identity is determined is by glycolipids. And so the arrow is pointing to a lipid, phospholipid, that has a carbohydrate attached to it. This is a glycolipid, and in blood types, a red blood cell that's type A will have a certain glycolipid, and a red blood cell that's type B blood will have a different glycolipid. Somebody who has AB blood will have both types of glycolipids. So that ends the lecture on cell structure. I'm sorry it was a little uh, chaotic. I have computer issues. Thank you.